please feel free to ask questions and, and add comments. And here's your moderator, Stacy Funderburg. Thanks, Christian. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stacy Funderburg, one of the program leads for the Working Farms Fund and Regional Council at the Conservation Fund. Since 1985, the Conservation Fund has protected over eight and a half million acres across uh, the country. And it's important to know that 3 million of those acres have been working lands like forests, ranches, and farms. And this work is a reflection of our commitment to the land and to local communities, to sustainable economic development and the livelihoods that support them. I'm so excited that you can join us today for this discussion of one of our newest programs, the Working Farms Fund, which is being launched right here where I work in Georgia. We have people joining from all over the country today, as Christian mentioned, and a few members of the media as well. We appreciate all of you taking the time to listen in. This topic really does impact all of us. I wanna start by acknowledging that this has been a challenging year for communities across the US in so many ways. This global pandemic has touched all of us and the breakdown in our current food system has been one of the many challenges that it has exposed. With a 70% increase in demand at local food banks, many of you have likely seen stories of families standing in line for hours to secure their next meal, while simultaneously watching farmers forced to dump their produce in the field because they can't get it to market fast enough in a very complex supply chain. These problems are a reflection of the long-term challenges for farming in our country. Farmland, particularly small and mid-sized farms, continue to disappear rapidly at a rate of three acres every single minute, 175 acres each hour. That means 262 acres of farmland will be lost in this country while we're on this call. And this is largely due to unchecked development and sprawl in large metro areas like Atlanta. The, um, the average age of the farmer in the US is 58 years old and climbing. And something very important is being lost. And it's not just farms and the knowledge of farming. We're losing a connection to the land, a connection to where our food comes from. However, despite all these challenges, there is real hope on the horizon. We're seeing an unprecedented surge in consumer demand for local and healthier food. The same cities where, whose rapid growth is gobbling up local farms are the center of this surging demand from people who want to know how their food was grown and who grew it. This is paired with a growing number of next generation farmers who are committed to this new local food system. They just need a bridge. They need access to capital, to markets, and a pathway to land access and farm ownership. The Working Farms Fund stands at the intersection of these challenges and opportunities for America's local food system. Through Working Farms Fund, we're creating a model that will protect critical farmland, support next generation farmers, and expand the local food system for Metro Atlanta. And we're building a model that can be scaled here in Georgia and then replicated over and over again in other places around the country. This isn't a problem that can be solved overnight, and it can't be solved by one person or one organization, which is why we brought together an incredible group of panelists today to highlight how we're already working together to rethink the future of our local food system. This afternoon, you're going to hear from a very successful farmer who chose to reinvest directly in his community in a food hub that supports many local growers across Georgia. You're gonna hear about revolutionary leadership by an institution that is committed to local and sustainable food sourcing for its students, its employees, and its hospital patients. You're gonna hear from two members of one of our first Working Farms Fund teams who truly represent the future of our local food system. We're working hand in hand with partners like these to build a healthier, more resilient local food system, and we're just getting started. So I'd now like to turn to our panel and I'm gonna let each one of the panelists give a quick introduction and background as we get started today. Demetrius. Hi everybody, I'm Demetrius Milling here in Atlanta. And Stacy, if I have any issues, just jump in and let me know if people can't hear me or not. But uh, I'm here in Atlanta, I'm an Atlanta native. 
uh, born and raised. I grew up in Decatur area. Uh, I have a family that did no farming at all and mostly blue collar background. And I got started in farming about six years ago. Um, I started volunteering on a farm called Brightside Farm in Atlanta. And then from there, I was encouraged to get an education and get a degree. So I went on to go to technical college where I earned a associate's degree in sustainable agriculture and horticulture. Uh, and from there, I managed that school's farm. And now I'm the assistant manager at Love is Love Farm, which is in Decatur, Georgia. Thanks, Demetrius. Hey, sorry, I have a little boy I had to go <laughs> take care of for a second. My name is Keenan Howitt. I'm Associate Vice President of Resilient Sustainability and Economic Inclusion for Emory and Emory Healthcare in Atlanta. And in that role, I help oversee and develop our sustainability vision and our resilience planning. Part of that vision is to have 75% of the food we procure from local or sustainable sources. And the resilience planning um, includes ensuring that our food supply is not vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. And so our role in the Working Farms Fund is to buy the food. Um, upfront, sight unseen, we're um, making commitments to farmers through food purchase agreements that we will buy the food and then they can take that agreement to the bank to secure the capital they need for their um, tractors or combines or whatever um, sort of farming implements. And that is sort of a key piece to making this all work. Um, I would also add, for those of you not familiar with Emory, uh, we are the largest employer in Metro Atlanta, and our healthcare system is the largest in Georgia. We have 11 hospitals, many clinics, and a large academic research center in the city. So we have a lot of students to feed, patients to feed, and it's critical that we make sure that our food can get here safely and local food enables that to happen. Thanks. Thanks, Kiana. Keith. All right. Uh, I'm Keith Kelly uh, and I'm the president of Kelly Products. Uh, it's a, we are an agricultural company with uh, multiple outlets. So we farm, uh, we grow cattle and and pigs down in southwest Georgia and heirloom corn that we convert to grits and cornmeal. And then we have a dairy in uh, Morgan County where we actually bottle milk and chocolate milk and buttermilk and make ice cream and cheese. And then we have a retail uh, establishment in Madison, Georgia uh, that is a specialty grocery, full scale butcher shop, uh, and a farm to table cafe. And we have other ag concerns, but that, those are the three that are related to the food business. Thanks, Keith. Hi, I'm Judith Winfrey. Uh, I'm one of the co-owners of Love is Love Farm. Um, Love is Love is a certified organic vegetable operation. Um, we've been in operation for about 13 years. I own it with my husband, Joe. Um, and Joe and I were really called to farming. Um, both of us were liberal arts kids with very little real agricultural background. Uh, my grandfather was a sharecropper, um, but that uh, was a long, long time ago. Um, we were called to farming um, by the great environmentalist, Janice Ray. We saw her speak at a Georgia Organics Conference in 2006, and that sort of got us going. Um, and since then, I've had about a 15 year career in sustainable food systems. I helped found a number of organizations that serve farmers and eaters alike, uh, creating markets for farmers and creating food accessibility for people. Uh, I ran for five years a meal kit business that distributed nationally um, and focused on buying local food. Um, and I have a, a small business now called Small Bites Adventure Club that's really focused on getting um, kids to love their vegetables. 
Um, somewhere in the middle of all of that, I ran uh, restaurant operations. I was the COO of Ho Hopkins Hospitality for five years. Um, and I have a small consulting firm called Resonant Ideas, where I, I help food businesses focus on systems and culture improvements. Uh, I also am working with Demetrius and a group of other farmers, as well as my husband, Joe, uh, to stand up a cooperative farm, um, a worker-owned cooperative farm. It'll be Love is Love Cooperative Farm. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, everyone. As you can see, we have a really talented panel today with a lot of experience and expertise. So uh, I think uh, I'll get started maybe with a question to you, Keith. And, and it just so happens that uh, one of the farms, the dairy that Keith owns in Morgan County is very near to where I grew up. And so um, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I can also tell you because I spent a lot of time driving through this area, how I've seen uh, farmland in the area change over time. But Keith, I'm curious, what have you personally seen happen with local food uh, and, the, and really the farming community around the Morgan County area and beyond since you've been there? Yeah, so <clears throat> in Morgan County, when, when I was growing up, uh, it was mostly rural farmland. Uh, there, were, there was 125, 30 dairies in the county back in the 60s, 70s, along in there. Um, even into the 80s, early 80s. Today, there's only eight dairies left. Uh, two of them have become quite large. The, the remainders are small like our dairy. Uh, and most of the row cropping and things like that are pretty much gone. Uh, it, you know, it's economies of scale, it's all those kind of things that have happened with this consolidated food system. But, you know, you can take that same thing and go all over Georgia because it's happened everywhere uh, where our food system has become very, very consolidated, whether you're talking about row cropping or cattle or dairy or any of those different agricultural practices, they have become very, very consolidated and it's happening all over America. So it's not just in Georgia, it's all over America. Rural communities have dried up. I, I would challenge anybody to go anywhere rural America and you'll see dried up communities. Uh, it's because our food systems have become so consolidated and it, you know, for me, it's a pretty scary thing to understand and just realize just how consolidated they are. If, if I were a foreign entity that wanted to take over America, I wouldn't worry about guns and bullets. I'd just come attack our food system because it's, uh, it's pretty perilous in my opinion of how consolidated. And I think this pandemic has shown that, you know, where we ran out of various commodities because of how consolidated it is. So, yeah. but it is definitely uh, in Morgan County where I live, it has changed dramatically in 50 years, 60 years, I mean, really dramatically. Yeah, thanks, Keith. I, I remember driving that section of 441 and you'd see so many dairy farms growing up and now you see a lot of for sale signs or you see a new subdivision with farm and name only. Um, despite all those challenges, I mean, one of the things that I'm heartened by, Keith, is what you've done there in Morgan County could you talk for a few minutes about the investment you made in Farmview Market and why you chose to do that um, a little more? You know, I am uh, I'm encouraged by what you guys are doing, number one. Let me just say that because I think it, it fits. The model today for farming is that, in my opinion, there's kind of three options. You either have to get really big to stay in it, so you're going to compete in that industrial food system, and because the margins are so slim, you have to get really, really big. And many farmers can't do that, so they end up going out. They can't afford the land or they can't, there's not land not available to them or whatever the case may be. And so they end up having to get out. Uh, the other option that I see and what we're really working on is a vertical integration model. So our store is really, uh, that's, it's an experiment in vertical integration. So we're raising cattle, I'll just take that for an example. We're going from a cow-calf operation, we're turning around and finishing the calves all the way out to finishing weight, and then we're turning around and going to the abattoir, having them processed, bringing them to our store where we're doing all the further, the finished processing, and we have a cafe, so we're actually serving you the hamburger. So that's the total, you know, we say it's from, you know, from beginning to end or uh, uh, conception to consumption. So, uh, 
that's kind of what that play is. But we also offer that same kind of an opportunity for a lot of farmers. We have about 300 farm families and small businesses that supply products to our grocery store. And then we have others that supply meat products, eggs, you know, those kind of things to our grocery and to our meat department. We're buying from other farmers, their, their cattle, their pork, you know, those kind of things. Uh, so allowing them not to have to get into the industrial food system and, you know, getting completely big. And one of the things, you know, an example of what we're doing there. So we allow these mom and pop, as we call them, small businesses to sell us direct um, without having to go through a distributor. And the challenge for that is, you know, if we were buying from a distributor, one truck would back up with 300 products on it. Uh, it you know, as an example, now we have 300 trucks back up because all these people have their own products and whatever. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but it's not something that is overbearing for us. And it accomplishes part of our mission, which is allowing them to be vertically integrated. So, uh, but it, it, and we've made a pretty substantial investment. As you know, it's about a 30,000 square foot facility there. And we went to pretty good extremes by putting old barns in it and stuff like that to, you know, to replicate what it might have looked like back in the day, whatever. And we have a grist mill in our store. So we're actually bringing in heirloom corn and grinding it right there fresh every day. But, uh, but I do think it is a model that is, can be replicated across the country where local farmers can produce and they can own it through that, you know, system and not have to sell it on a wholesale, really, really, really wholesale basis and, and get huge to be able to stay in business. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Keith. Well, I've spent plenty of, of my money there um, and the food is delicious. And, and it really is great to be there supporting um, farm, local farmers. And I, I think um, you pointed out that, I mean, this is a, a way that farmers can have a viable, a viable business here. And I think farms like Love is Love have proven that out. So Demetrius, I'd like to turn to you um, because I think you're perfectly representative of this next generation of farmers who we're trying to support, who is perfectly positioned to be selling at a place like Farmview Market and producing nearby. Uh, how, why and how did you start farming? And, and, and also, um, as someone who's, who's a, still a young farmer, but who's been at it for a while, what, what keeps you committed to it long term? Yeah, so I, I got my start in farming, like I said, about six years ago, working at Brightside Farm. But before that, I was going to Georgia State University, and I grew up in a household that was mostly blue, blue collar. So when we came home, we relaxed. And it was also really cool to see photos uh, of the work that my, my parents did every single day. And so really, for me, it was having tangible things that I could see my parents creating and being a creator were uh, really big for me. And so when I was in college, I really wanted a job like that. So I started asking people, you know, what do you like about your job? What don't you like about your job? And there was a lot of commonalities uh, what, about what people don't like about their jobs. And it was they wanted to learn something new all the time. They felt they weren't learning new things. They wanted to be challenged all the time. And they really just wanted to see success uh, and like have results. And sometimes that's really hard in some jobs. So I set out on the path to find that. And uh, meeting Erin Siscuti at Brightside Farm, she really showed me that. And after working there for a week, I was like, this is what I want to do every day. Um, we were having some challenges, like every single day, we were trying to get something done. We we're creating something and then we were selling something. So it was really awesome to be a part of. And from there, you know, I was encouraged to go to school. And once I got into Gwinnett Technical College, like the, every time you learn something in farming, I feel like a new door has opened up. So uh, you think you master one thing and there's a new door of all these things you never even considered. And so those are all things that really keep me going. Um, and then I got connected with Joe and Judith over at Love is Love Farm. And they welcomed me in, taught me some of the things they were doing and just brought me into their awesome creation that they had going on. And it's just been really great. I've learned a lot here, but also just adding some of the things that I know and them being very open to having that around. Uh, so when I hear about Keith talking about his community that dairy farms were super prevalent and our rural communities were thriving at some point or even just making good in a place where people wanted to be, uh, that's a real call to action for a person like me. I have some skills and some talent and 
that is where the land is and that's where the community that understands that uh, is. And what Keith is talking about is for our entire country, our food system is pretty vulnerable. So for a person like me that's really got the skill, the knowledge, I really wanna go out and help uh, my community and feed my community. That's great, Thank, thanks Demetrius. Uh, I'm wondering too, when you think about, um, you, as we said, you already have a very successful farm. Uh, you and Joe and Judith, I mean, you have markets that you sell to some of the best restaurants in town. You have a very committed CSA and, and you're doing great, but now you're at the edge of potentially scaling up. Um, how, how does the Working Farms Fund fit in for you as a bridge to that next step and scaling up Love is Love? Yeah, um, right now, Love is Love is located at Guy Gardens in Decatur, and we've been super thankful to be able to rent the land here from the East Lake Commons community. But we're getting to the point where, especially in this year, where people are really looking for local food, you see the demand is just so great. And you see there's a lot of potential to grow and to capture some of that market. What we're doing here is something that people want to be a part of and people want to support. And the only way we can grab all that support is by expanding our operation and putting more food in the ground and feeding more people. And the Working Farms Fund, the opportunity to expand that uh, would be would be awesome and great. And the way that the Working Farms Fund is set up, I'm pretty sure you'll go into a little bit more, Stacy. but the ability to rent the land in the beginning and not take on all that debt in the very beginning while we scale up the business is super helpful. Yeah, thanks, Demetrius. And, and maybe I will pause for a second and uh, I will remind people if you have, um, we are going to have time at the end for uh, Q&A. Um, and as Christian mentioned, he'll be monitoring that. So please put your questions in the, in the chat as we go, as things pop up. Um, but this is a good point. Um, one, the way that the Working Farms Fund, I'll, I'll use the Love is Love team as an example, and they're likely to be, they, we're actually um, very close to purchasing the farm that they've identified and we've worked with them on. And so we will step out and buy this uh, mid-sized farm that is at risk of being lost to development over time. And we will match the Love is Love team to that site on day one. And we're going to enter into a lease with them that will give them an option to purchase the property in the next three to five years. And then we're going to secure uh, through local, state, federal funding, uh, the purchase of a conservation easement, which accomplishes two key things. One is it protects that land forever, keeps it from being broken up or fragmented or developed, which gives it the best opportunity to remain a farm. But another important thing is it brings that farm in this geography down from development value, which is the highest, the highest and best use from a value standpoint, down to true farmland value and puts that farm business and those farmers in a much better position to get affordable farmland and have a much better chance of having a viable farm business long term. And then we will help them secure the financing they need to purchase the farm at that step down price. And that fun, those funds will roll into the next farm purchase, really expanding the impact of this program over time. But a really key piece of that as well um, that I'm so excited about, and we're so lucky to have this partnership is with Emory. And we signed an MOU with them um, in uh, December last year. And it is really thanks to the hard work of Kianet Howitt and Mindy Goldstein of the Turner Environmental Law Cl Clinic we have an opportunity to, um, to be able to provide those farmers with a new market and a certain market and a long-term market, which is also really key to their success. So Kenneth, I, it, I, I wanna turn to you and uh, I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about why Emory is committed to local and sustainable sourcing and elaborate a little bit more on how you see the Farm Fund programming al program align with those goals. Sure. So Emory's commitment to a robust local sustainable food supplies for a lot of reasons, some of the reasons that Keith and Demetrius talked about in terms of ensuring rural economic health and vitality and preserving the culture of the family farm, because with that comes preservation of open space and habitat and biodiversity um, throughout our state. 
Also, Emory has a deep commitment to uh, climate action. We have a carbon neutral goal by 2050. I hope to get halfway there by 2030. And so our interest is in reducing the distance between farm and table. And that this is a great way to do that. Um, and so we reduce fossil fuel use, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we're also really excited about the potential to use regenerative agriculture to sequester carbon and have researchers at Emory who are working hard on that issue now. Another area of interest for Emory is a safe and just workplace in the agricultural sector and of course all sectors. Um, and so a lot of our sustainability criteria deal with worker and animal welfare. And also in Georgia, as I'm sure many of you know, um, the issue of systemic racism is so prevalent and deep seated and in Georgia, women and African Americans and Native Americans, you know, there are um, many, many people who didn't have not had access to land or have had land taken from them. Um, and so what we're really excited about is our MOU says that we will really target uh, farmers who are women, Native Americans, African Americans, all the underrepresented groups so that hopefully we can start building that new generation of farmers. Um, so Emory's interest really is that intersection of climate, health, and equity. And we see this partnership fulfilling that vision and mission perfectly. That's great. Th thanks, Kianet. Um, could, could you talk briefly about how um, this your students and employees have reacted to this commitment in particular? I'm glad you asked because I think overwhelmingly um, they're very proud. You know, when we first set the goal of 75% local or sustainable food because it was so ambitious and we knew it was a moonshoot, um, you know, a lot of people kind of say, oh, yeah, 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 you know, you're saying that, but, you know, and we've worked so hard for 15 years to get to a point where about 40% of our food is sourced from local or sustainable sources, really starting from a point where we didn't even know where our food was coming from, you know, to finally having deep relationships with farming, farmers and um, the farming community. But obviously we can't stop there. And I think what this is showing our students and staff is that we really meant it when we said it. We really feel deeply committed to um, not just being passive and accepting local food if it's available, but really being part of a partnership to create a more uh, robust local sustainable food system. And so we are pretty sure that through this Working Farms Fund, we'll be able to get to that 75%, but without it, we wouldn't. Um, so I think they uh, care very much as we do about the health and equity pieces. They care about their own nutrition. You know, we see this as an investment in their health because that will reduce our healthcare costs, our lost productivity, um, you know, it's an investment in our students and our staff to ensure that they have good food available to them. Great. Thank you. Well, building off of that, Judith, I wonder, and you, you know this because you've been on both sides. I mean, you're now part of this farm team that is looking to expand. Um, you've been a purchaser from farmers. So, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it is so important to build a diverse and sustainable market while we protect land and prepare next generation farmers to be matched to, to those farms. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think like any good, um, like any good problem and any good solution, it's, it's really complex. Um, and, and farming is, critical, sustainable farming, organic, regenerative agriculture is really critical to land and environmental protection. 
Um, you know, I think of farmers as the guardians of ecosystems um, on many different levels, like from the microbiology of the soil to the microbiology of the gut. Um, farmers provide sustainability in this really comprehensive way. Um, at the same time, you know, farmers, um, most farmers, most farmers I know are doing this work. Um, I mean, the National Young Farmers Coalition says they're doing it as a public service, right? That it, it, is, a, it is a vocation that is rewarding in ways beyond financial. And sometimes the financial piece is really challenging. Um, and I think, you know, so if we, if we hold that farming is essential to environmental and land protection, and that um, farming can be financially challenging, I, I think, you know, you've got, you've got to start any farm business from the perspective of the farmer has to be able to thrive. The farmer has to be able to live in a way that meets the most basic of human needs. They, they need a decent income, they need healthcare, they need childcare, they need vacation time and rest time, they need a retirement. Um, and we don't currently operate, you know, as Keith said earlier, we don't really currently operate in a system that makes that easily available to farmers. Um, you know, I know many young farmers who have thrown in the towel. They just, they can't do the work and make the money and make the risk worth the reward, even though they love it. Um, so I see diversified markets as a really important way to build sustainability for the farm and to build a viable farm business. Um, you know, on our farm, there's two reasons uh, that diversification is important. Um, and one is just the business case, like, you know, pardon the farm pun, but you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You, you need, um, you need diversified products, which is definitely part of what a small scale organic farm like ours does, but you also need diversified markets. Uh, wholesale markets can protect you from losses. They can become, uh, you know, almost like a safety valve when you have overproduction. Um, you know, retail markets obviously are incredibly valuable, um, but the more you can find different customers to take different pieces of the business, the more stable your farm is. And I think that's an argument that, that everybody understands about why diversification is important. Um, there's another piece of it, and Keena touched on it a little bit, and I mean, perhaps it's a little more esoteric, but you know, on our farm, we think a lot about, um, how just how important food is because food literally becomes who you are. What you eat is the fuel that feeds your brain and your hair and your eyes and everything that you are. Um, so nutrition and health can, it can change your consciousness. It can literally change your life. Um, so if, you, if you'll take this sort of like logical leap with me that food is the most important thing, um, you can understand why it's important to have a viable, healthy food system. Um, you also, you know, we've known for a long time that, that freshness impacts nutrition. So the, the more vibrant your local food system is, the more... Um, the, the healthier your food will be because it's there's less time in transit and there are environmental reasons for that, but there are also these health reasons for that. Um, so if you, and now we have this research that connects mental health to gut health. And so that makes this food all the more important. And I know you're all wondering, how am I gonna take this back to diversified markets? And here's how. The more diversified our market is, the more people we're feeding the more people are getting access to this healthy, nutritious food that I believe can per change their lives, change their consciousness. Great. Th thanks, Judith. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I actually was lucky. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I was lucky enough 
to grow up next door to my grandparents. My grandfather had, we called them gardens. I think they would qualify as the size of urban farms today, maybe a couple acres each, but he grew all the food for my extended family, both my my immediate family and then uh, a couple of my aunts and, and their extended families. And I completely took that for granted. I don't think I'd had canned vegetables until I went off to college and I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but looking back now, having access to that fresh food consistently was, was amazing. Now, don't get me wrong. My grandfather did get a little child labor out of it. I remember falling behind the tractor and digging potatoes and as a game of sorts. Uh, but, uh, but it really was great to have that. Um, and I, I wonder um, that Keith, I, I wanted to shift to you. I mean, we are in a moment right now um, as we talk about markets and all these things where there's been significant disruption. And, and it's, a, it's a strange thing because I've heard two sides of this coin. Uh, on, one, on one hand, we've seen how broken our markets have been. And I'd be curious your thoughts on that, Keith, what, elaborating on what you've seen during the pandemic and how that has um, broken up markets. And then I'd be curious for you and others to weigh in on uh, actually ways that has raised awareness of the need for a more resilient and local food supply. At the same time, I've heard stories from people who actually drove to the farmer's market at 4 a.m. every Saturday to be able to be successful and market their products, who now have uh, people in Metro Atlanta driving out to their farm every Saturday because they have a newfound appreciation of where their food comes from and it has opened up new opportunities. They're selling more online. So Keith, what have you, I mean, what have you seen locally, I guess, with your farm on the supply chain side? And then I'm also just curious about stories where you may be seeing a heightened awareness of the importance of local food, given the challenges that we're facing right now. Well, there's no doubt, number one, that uh, there is a growing consumer that prefers locally produced food, you know, would like to know the farmer. Um, they have an interest in that. They have, a, there's a heightened interest in food. You know, when I was growing up, we just ate whatever. I mean, we ate all locally produced because they produced right there on our farm. But, you know, we didn't, we didn't really think about it like in terms of what we do today. But we, if you fast forward to today, you know, most food is processed, highly processed. Uh, we've lost a lot of flavor and, and nutritional value. Uh, you know, they're talking about local. It's, it's really the riper the, the plant, you know, the riper the crop is, the more healthy it is because the nutritional value, a lot of it comes at the very end when it's becoming ripe. But g going back to your question about the whole local food system, what we've seen, you know, the, the industrial food system operates on the economy of scale. And so what, what happened with all this when schools went down, as an example, 50% uh, of our milk today goes into the school lunch program of all milk produced in the US, that's where it was going. Well, these factories are built to do boxed milk. So they couldn't convert fast enough into gallons and change the whole plant over to do milk for grocers and whatever else. So that's why we ran out of milk in grocery stores. That's why they were pouring out milk because there was no place to go with it. Even though the demand didn't change one bit, it shifted from the school to the home. And yet the industrial food system was set up so that these giant plants were just producing those products and they couldn't shift. There's no way to shift. Same thing had happened in the, the pork industry, the beef industry, pork in particular, where they just had to slaughter hogs and get rid of them because there was no way to shift away from the restaurant business into the grocery business because of the way they were packaging and doing things. So when, when things disrupted our traditional way of, or the way we were buying food through restaurants, through the school system and things like that, when that went down, it totally disrupted this industrial food system where locally produced, like in my own business, we never ran out of hamburger. We sold a lot, lot more than we normally would. Some days we sold as much as 14, 1500 pounds of hamburger. But because we were raising our own and buying from other farmers and doing our own kill process, we had all that that was needed. So we never ran out of any of those products. That's the advantage of a localized food system. If you've got it where it's local, I mean, one community could run out, I suppose, but it's not going to be on a global scale like we saw in the U.S. this year when, you know, 
whole states and big cities and whatever ran out of product. Shelves were bare. And like I say, the consumption didn't go up. It's not like all of a sudden we gained another X million people. We didn't gain any more people. It's just that the shift took place in the way that people were getting their product. And the industrial food system was, because of economies of scale, was set up to only produce a certain way and could not make the shift over to get it to the home fast enough. Yeah. So I think there's a, but the bigger deal for me is that there is a growing number of people that do understand um, what Judith and some others have already said, and that is that our food is a part of our health, a big part of our health. Mm -hmm. You know, they now know, and I think if I were a young person today, I'd be studying the microbiome. If I were in school, if I was in college, that's exactly what I'd go study. We, our company is working with the University of Georgia right now on a putting in a lab to test the microbiome on cattle. They've done just a little bit of research, and it's a couple of years, but in terms of total research, not a lot, but they've done enough to know they had a herd of cattle in North Carolina and they separated high efficiency from low efficiency animals. The, the high efficiency animals, this is on a free choice feed basis. We're actually eating 10 pounds less feed per day than the low efficiency animals. And yet they were gaining more weight than those eating 10 pounds more. So you say, well, what does that mean? I mean, it means dollars, number one, that you save by not feeding 10 pounds you know, more per day. It's, it's less greenhouse gas. There's just a whole host of things that go into that 10 pounds of feed per animal that was fed you know, everything from fuel to whatever you want to say that was reduced. And when they studied the microbiome of those animals, they realized they were dramatically different. And so now they're working toward, can we produce a probiotic that might bring those low efficiency animals up to being higher efficiency animals, which is exactly what's going on in human health today with probiotics and looking at our microbiomes to realize, you know, how can we make a person healthier without medicine? By taking food, in particular, probiotics, things of that nature to make us healthier. So it's gonna be a big, big part of that whole thing, but it does play a role in, in what some others were talking about with reducing the carbon footprints and all those kind of things as we get more efficient at that. And I think it's gonna help local farmers uh, better to produce better, healthier animals and uh, with less resources, so. Yep. Agreed. And I, one thing I'm really excited about uh, on the, uh, for the Working Farms Fund is, for every farm that we acquire and we match a farmer to that site, we're going to be with that farmer for, for at least three to five, you know, maybe sometimes a little longer. They're developing these long-term relationships with Emory. Emory incentivizing them uh, with the purchase of, of their food for that more local and more sustainable with, with requirements that they've thought through. Um, we, you know, I think this is a, a way to incentivize that. But there's a huge opportunity for us not only to protect farmland, but to get more sustainable farming practices happening on site. And we're lucky. I mean, the timing is really good. Um, I was actually down um, at the Rodale's Southeast, Orga Out Southeast Organic Center, which just opened um, this week. And uh, they, of course, have been a leader in organic across uh, the world for many years and based in their farm in Pennsylvania, which I visited last year, but they, they have chosen to come to Georgia. Farming is a big deal in Georgia. There's a huge opportunity to get more sustainable farming in place. We have groups like Georgia Organics who've been working on this for a long time. Um, and I think we can really move the dial and I really hope we can move the dial in the direction uh, that can't, can't mention, which is ultimately showing that carbon footprint and how it's being reduced and, and that resulting in cash payments to those farmers to reward them for what they're doing. Um, I wonder if, um, I mean, Kiana, you may want to speak to that a little more. And, and I, I also would like to hear from Demetrius and Ju or, or Judith, maybe talking a little bit about their commitment to sustainable farming, why it's important. I mean, maybe you want to kick that off, Kiana, just on the, the commitment and um, the healthier food piece and the carbon piece. Sure. So, um, you know, in terms of the commitment, I think that is the the thing Emory's most excited about is that we have a role to play in helping support these farmers because they can use the food purchase agreement as collateral in the bank. And actually Stacy and I've met with bankers to try to help smooth that 
um, sort of ability to gain access to traditional financing, um, which, you know, has not always been easy for smaller farmers and I think has been part of the reason that there's been all this vertical integration and or all the consolidation rather that um, Keith mentioned. So um, that is really what we see as our key role. And part of what we're interested in is of course, Emory, because we're so large, we have a large carbon footprint from the electricity we purchase to run 24 seven operations like the hospital. And of course we're doing all we can to reduce our footprint ourselves, but we know we're gonna need to purchase offsets to get to that carbon neutral point by 2050. And so we're really interested in offsets that have a social good. And so one of the things we're working with right now is faculty who are ensuring that regenerative agricultural practices sequester carbon and other greenhouse gases over time and helping to really crack the nut on what those regenerative practices need to be and how you ensure their long-term um, kind of uh, that the capture is not on just a short-term basis, but is more permanent in nature, which is a, a hallmark of a really viable offset program. Um, we know that there are many programs right now out there that are, you know, available where you can purchase um, offsets for various agricultural practices, but we feel as though the research could be more robust around that um, because it's really meaningless for an institution like Emory to purchase an offset saying, we know we're buying this much electricity from Georgia Power and we think this much is being sequestered in farm fields. We need to know that 100%, just as sure as we are of that smokestack uh, billowing out um, the carbon, we need to be sure that that um, those greenhouse gases are sequestered in the soils and we don't feel as though the research is quite there yet. So that's one of the things that this we hope will enable us to do is to be able to work with farmers and see if we could do some research, you know, maybe one of them would plant on a field, you know, um, red clover and then we can compare that ability to sequester greenhouse like gases to some other cover crop and, you know, do that kind of cooperative um, research together so that we can get a better handle on this. And this is really important internationally. Our key faculty member who's working on this does work in China, throughout Southeast Asia, because these are unanswered questions um, that I think the Working Farms Fund um, and this partnership can help unlock. And then what's so wonderful about it is then that there'll be a monetary path for farmers to have an incentive to do regenerative agriculture and actually get some money for these good practices that they're doing. Yeah, that's that's true. And Demetrius, maybe um, could you speak for a minute about lo the Love is Love team's commitment to um, sustainable and regenerative ag. I mean, why? Hopefully you get a premium, you know, for growing that way, but I, I think there are other reasons too. So I'm just curious um, why that's an underpinning of the, for the Love is Love farm team too. Yeah, um, we only have one earth, so we got to take care of the best way we can. That, that's, I think, the first thing for us. Um, but here at Love is Love, we do things like cover cropping. We are certified organic and we get audited every single year. Um, we use drip irrigation, things to conserve those resources. And it's really important for us because all these things are gonna allow us to farm for a very long time in the future. We don't wanna treat the soil, which is our most important asset, uh, as if it's something that we can buy and sell very easily because it's not, and it takes a very long time for organic farms to build the soil necessary to do this type of farming. Um, in all farms, uh, the soil is the most important asset. It's not the seeds that you buy, it is the soil. And I think that the important thing here with the conservation fund, we talk about these programs that perhaps farmers can be paid for sequestering carbon. And, and for an organic farm, it takes a long time to build the soil to a capacity where you can get the yields that you need. But any program that our government sets up uh, today or in the future in our entire government is really based around land ownership. And so without that piece, young farmers are 
bound to just miss out. And when we ask why aren't farmers doing more sustainable practices today, most of it is rooted in the fact that the NRCS and other government organizations pay landowners for the most part, part to have these practices. So the work that the conservation fund is trying to accomplish and allow farmers to see the benefit of these things, not only ownership and equity, but be able to be paid for any program that's created in the future uh, is really big. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really uh, a really good point, and it is one of the reasons I think it's important. I view the Working Farms Fund as creating really a patient pathway to land to farm ownership, immediate land ac farm access, but a patient pathway to land ownership, and it, it's an opportunity to connect farmers on site with programs that help them uh, and sometimes reward them for work they're already doing on site. Uh, and also to get them in a position to access the more traditional farm credit or local bank financing. I mean, many of the farmers who will enter our program couldn't just walk in and get a loan uh, from the bank today to buy the farm that they want um, and that they need to be successful. So I'm really looking forward to working with uh, many of these talented farmers um, as we work towards that. Um, we're going to wind up in a few minutes, but um, I wonder, we've talked about a lot of the opportunities and challenges of the food system in Georgia, and this is more of a group question. And um, I want to ask, if you were thinking about all these challenges in our current environment, you had one quick takeaway that you would want people to have from this discussion, uh, what would it be? Anyone feel free to, to uh, jump in. Well, I can go. Oh, go ahead, Keith. I just going to say, you know, the, there's one um, misconception, and I know each one of you that are farming would agree with this. Uh, and, I, and I also had this misconception. So growing up, we traditionally farmed with, you know, traditional fertilizers, granular, you know, fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, the tr traditional industrial farm as it exists today. Um, it's very difficult once you're in that method to not continue in that method. And I'll just give you an example. Somebody comes out with a new hybrid seed. Uh, you say, well, I don't want to use that. You know, it's GMO, it's whatever. I'm not going to do that. But yet the global market is set up based on production. And so if that seed makes 10 more bushels per acre, 20 more bushels per acre, and you say, I'm not going to do it. So you can sit back and make 20 bushels per acre or less than everybody else's, but pretty soon you're going to be out of business. So it's almost a forced involvement into that whole practice. So when I, we started 15 years ago, maybe that far, somewhere along that range, growing a garden for our employees, just a fun thing. And I was doing it just the traditional way, you know, traditional insecticides, fertilizers, everything else making a nice garden for everybody. Everybody enjoyed it. So my son comes along and he's got a degree in organic agriculture or a certificate from the University of Georgia. He got a degree in economics, went back, got a certificate in organic agriculture. So he joins our company. He says, dad, I'd like to take over the garden and I'd like to take it in organic. And, you know, I know all this stuff, you know, I'm really smart about agriculture. So I said, all right, you can, you're going to lose a lot of production, but go for it. So uh, he said, all right, well, I'm going to convert it. And I said, all right, go for it. Today, we make more crops, more, more tonnage of pr product. We grow about 100,000 pounds of produce a year that we give to our employees. But it's more, more beautiful, healthier. Uh, he's cover cropping everything continually. So he pulls a crop off. He cover crops with different things during the summer, winter, whatever. He's continually rotating. But we're making a better, we have a better farm there for, and we grow about eight or nine acres of vegetables than we've ever made and it's totally organic. So it can be done on a bigger scale. You know, it's just, most people don't think it can. I yeah. mean, that, that's the truth of the matter. And it would be difficult to do it in the commodities today. So trying to grow corn or cotton or soybean, but when it comes to vegetables, yeah, uh, I think it can definitely be done. And I think that's where it'll start. And I think that's probably what you guys, most of you are doing is not the commodity type crops like corn and cotton and soy and soybeans or peanuts, whatever y'all are growing vegetables for human consumption, uh, local human consumption. And that 
I think it's perfectly fitted for that. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of success in that. Um, and I think more success than if you were doing it kind of the industrial model way, at least that's been my experience and which yeah. is, and it, it was a huge, you know, kind of eye opening moment for me. Yeah. It's funny you say that. And when you were saying that too, Keith, it made me think it's also taking the long-term view versus the short term. Uh, it's really interesting. Sure. Um, that's great. Thank you, Judith. Uh, I think you were going to jump in with something too. Yeah, I have a quickie, but I want to respond just a little bit to what Keith said and, and say, I think part of what we all should be thinking about doing um, in our lives everywhere in the food system and beyond is just rejecting the notion that we have to participate in a system of extraction and exploitation to be successful. Like, I think that's what conventional agriculture is based on, where sustainable ag is based more on reciprocity and relationship and really playing that long game, like you were saying, Stacy. And I think, um, you know, I think we live in an economic system that tells us that it's not possible and it actually is, and it's actually better for us and it's better for the world. Um, the one thing, the three things that I want everyone to take away today is buy food from farmers, get to know a farmer. It's important for you and your health. It's important for the planet and it's important for the local economy. Thank you, that's great. Um, Kiana, Demetrius, I think we're gonna to turn to questions in a minute. Any last takeaway or maybe something that gives you hope um, in the current moment, um, despite all the challenges that we face? Well, I can just say that if there are any potential institutional partners listening, I would just encourage them to think about their procurement power and their tremendous resources that they're investing. And they have a choice to invest it in their local community. And investing in local food um, not only is a good thing to do in terms of furthering um, you know, nutrition and health and uh, preparing us for the challenges of climate change, but it's an incredibly smart thing to do in terms of risk management. And when I was briefing every senior leadership to sign on to the Working Farms Fund, a lot of what I was talking about was resilience planning and risk management. So I would just encourage institutional um, put partners to reach out. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about why this is working for us. Thanks. Demetrius, any, any uh, final thoughts before we turn to the Q&A? Yeah, um, I feel the conversation that Keith was bringing up and Judith was responding to, I feel like we can have a whole uh, Zoom uh, meeting about that just in general. Uh, it's, it's pretty deep. But I, I would go along with Judith, the, thing, the things that she pointed out, and more importantly, that anyone on this call, every farm is a small business, and small businesses need supporters, and your money and you showing up uh, goes a long way. A lot of farmers show up at four o'clock in the morning to set up at farmer's markets, and you know, I always think uh, at the end of the year at Love is Love, we run a CSA that's got 210 members. And that's kind of the foundation of our business. And it kind of blows my mind that the foundation of this business just counts on 210 households. The foundation. And we can take this so much further. And we've been able and been blessed to go so far. But our foundation is just 210 people. That is not a lot of people in the grand scheme of things. Um, so anything that you can do really goes a long way. That's great. Well, this has been uh, a wonderful conversation. I think I'm going to turn it back to Christian and um, I, I haven't been able to follow the chat as much. So I think what we're going to do is um, Christian's going to screen some questions. We may not get to everything, of course, and please follow up with us afterwards if we miss your question. Um, but he's going to uh, screen through and, and throw out a few for the panel. Christian? Yeah, thanks, Stacy. What a enlightening and amazing discussion. Um, so I, I, there have been several great questions and more coming in. So uh, as, as they come in, I'll try to filter them. But um, just from the top, there was a really great question. Um, you know, what systems are there to support new farmers and provide apprenticeship and, uh, and training for, for new farmers who are just starting out? And then 
how could those farmers access land after they have they have been growing and created a track record of farming for a few seasons? Great. I, I think that may be a good question for the, um, I mean, Keith, you may have some thoughts on this too, but I know the Love is Love team, you have um, people who come out and spend time on the farm. I, I mean, I believe Joe uh, has had many mentors over the years and now is a mentor to many other small farmers. So I don't know if Judith or you or Demetrius want to speak to that. Sure. Um... I'll take a stab, but I want to go ahead and acknowledge that. I mean, you see who's sitting on a farm and who's not sitting on a farm between the two of us, right? So Demetrius has a lot more hands-on day-to-day experience on the farm. Um, but, you know, early on, I think Joe and I both felt a big commitment to community. And yeah, to your point, Stacey, we had some great mentors and great uh, support along the way. Joe started his apprenticeship at a great farm um, in Newton County actually called um, Crystal Organic Farm, learned a ton, and then was given an opportunity to farm with um, a grower in Douglas County, um, uh, the Glo Skip Glover and Glover Family Farm. Um, and, and early on we wanted to be um, as soon as we felt qualified, you know, we wanted to give other people an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, at that time, there weren't as many training programs um, institutionally for farmers um, in the Southeast. And, you know, I think I'm going to guess most people here can recognize that different ecosystems, different climates, different topographies have different challenges and the Southeast is unique. And, and we needed farmers um, to, to be able to get hands-on experience. So we've found lots of young farmers through the years. I don't know that we have found any young farmers as stellar, as committed, and um, as really just wonderful as Demetrius Melling. Um, he is a total blessing and we're so glad to have him on the team. Um, but you know, there are lots of other small farms that we know that also, you know, have, they're not internship programs. I mean, they're, we've always paid a, a, a fair rate for employees and we think that's a really important piece of it too. We're not looking for free labor in an apprentice program, but are learning to, are seeking to share skills and knowledge um, and expertise to the extent that we feel like we have it. Yeah. But Demetrius, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the formalities of that. Yeah, yeah. so I would say the different, different, first of all, working on a farm is the most important aspect if you want to do this. Uh, I went to Gwinnett Technical College, like I said, that education was awesome. If anybody has the opportunity to get an education in that form, I would highly recommend it. Um, I chose a technical college because I wanted to do this job without any debt. And so technical college was pretty uh, cheap. And also I learned a lot and I was able to have conversations with mentors on a higher level. But if I just went to school and I didn't work, I would still be very far behind. And I think there's different situations. Like at Love is Love, we always pay people uh, who work here. And if we depend on them showing up constantly, day in and day out, they will be paid. Other people, the knowledge that they give you um, is your compensation. So I think that people, if you're looking to get into this, you really need to set your mind to what am I willing to do and what situation is best for your circumstances. Um, some people have to be willing to travel, but I would first reach out to anybody local, um, see if they're hiring, if you can do that. Um, and if it's an internship and if you don't feel that you can make a huge commitment, maybe that's the best thing for you. But I would say, you know, find out what you want to commit to and then work with your local farmers from there. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I think we'll uh, throw out another question. I will just add to that that one of the things I'm excited about for the Working Farms Fund is there are a lot of great training programs. Obviously, we have a great, uh, amazing ag programs at UGA and ABAC and other schools. Um, but, you know, these farmers have to be building a path to somewhere. And that somewhere often means land and farm ownership to be successful long term. So my hope is that we can create a new place for those farmers to land as they come through these successful farmer programs. So I think there's a huge opportunity there long term. Christian, want to 
Hello. Yeah, we've gotten a number of questions that have kind of gone to uh, the Working Farms Fund specifically and, and its geography, where it's focused right now, where it's being piloted and where it could go uh, geographically from there. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll take that uh, at least initially. So um, the initial geography for this Working Farms Fund uh, pilot that we're working on is roughly what I would call 30 county Metro Atlanta, um, the larger Metro Atlanta, but primarily focused on the rural edge of that where there's still tremendous development pressure over time um, and the loss of farmland, but farmland is still somewhat affordable and there are still communities that have a long history of farming. And so our goal is to get out a little ahead of that curve and be able to secure these farms um, and match farmers to them and get them on a path to, to land ownership. We also have a goal of creating networks of farms. I mean, as you can hear just from the farmers on this call, there's so much to be gained from the sharing of knowledge, the cooperation around markets. And so we hope to build out a, a network of these small to mid-sized farms that are working together and beginning to transform the local food system. But this is, this is not specific to Atlanta and it's not specific to Georgia. There are other places in Georgia that we can do this and there are plenty of other places around the country that have these same challenges and where the Working Farms Fund could help uh, begin to solve them. Wherever there is that development pressure where farms are at risk of being lost and then there is a huge metropolitan center where a lot of the demand and markets emanate from, those are really a, a huge part of the match to make this work. So um, I'll say that we, we're already talking with colleagues uh, in the Chicago area and um, in the Pacific Northwest. There are lots of other places where um, this could be a great program to grow the local food system and support these same kind of uh, farmers and, and protect farms that are at risk of being lost. Thank you. Um, you know, there, there's been a few questions, um, and I think it might be a good opportunity to, to talk a little bit about um, the funding of the Working Farms Fund. How does it work? Um, where is it coming from? How are we stepping out and buying these properties? So I was, I was, I was thinking maybe I could actually put up the Working Farms Fund model graphic, and you can speak to that for a minute. Sure. And I'll get started. Um, the Conservation Fund, a, a lot of our success around the country has been with a, a revolving fund model where we are able to take um, capital, often philanthropic capital from donations, from foundations, um, and really stretch that um, over to get a lot of conservation work done. So um, we are still raising uh, revolving fund dollars for the Working Farms Fund here, and we will uh, likely, given the, the demand there is, we will always be raising new revolving fund dollars. But the important thing to understand is that way, the way we'll use them, if you could see the model now, is um, we're building up a revolving fund, the capital that we would have ready to go to go out and acquire small to mid-sized farms that are at risk of being lost to development. And, and we haven't talked about this, but I do just want to mention it. We're talking about the compelling farmers um, who want to be matched to land. There are a lot of compelling stories here of sixth and seventh generation farms where the kids aren't coming back to the farm, the grandkids aren't coming back. And there is real fear of losing this family farm to development and it becoming something else. But those farmers can't just sell it for nostalgia's sake uh, to, for at um, the real farmland value. So there, that is a huge part of this. So we're acquiring those farms that are at risk of being lost to development using our revolving fund capital. Then immediately we will match a farmer who is already uh, shown that they want to be on this site. And we will enter into a lease with an option to purchase when they're ready. There's a lot of work that will be done. Christian will be leading a lot of this, working with those farmers on site to get access to markets with great partnerships like Emory to get access to uh, our partners at NRCS and Ag Extension to get everything they need to help them have a viable farm business on site. Then we'll work through existing programs. Uh, for example, 
uh, USDA has uh, programs that allow um, them to purchase an agricultural conservation easement. It can still remain a farm, uh, but in that third step, we're purchasing an easement, bringing significant funding to the table to secure the permanent conservation on that property and bring that price down, which brings us to the final step where we've been working with that farmer to create a track record on that site that gets them in a position to be able to qualify for the financing they need to purchase that farm at that lower value. And if you think about this, you, you have the, um, the, the farmer uh, is in a market rate lease um, that we, we work out with them. But the important thing is the easement funding comes in um, and then the farmer purchases the farm and then those funds roll on to the next farm. So today we might be buying the Love is Love farm but within three to five years, that money will be rolling out into the next farm. And so every investment in the Working Farms Fund is going to um, multiply, uh, likely four times over over the next 20 years. So it is, it's a model that has been successful through our working, uh, we have a Working Forest Fund model that's been very successful using the same buy, protect, sell model. And we uh, know that it will work. There are other programs around the country that have been very successful with this same model. So we're really excited and um, we'll continue to fundraise for that revolving fund. We'll continue um, to make sure we have the programmatic uh, support to move forward, but we have all the pieces in place um, to get started and we're really excited about it. Awesome. Um... One really great question, and I think there are some panelists that might be able to help field this uh, for us. You know, could could we discuss some of the efforts to get this locally grown food uh, to people in the community who need it most? Um, there are places, you know, in Atlanta where there are food deserts. You know, how how are we going to undertake that, and and what's going to happen there? Yep. Does someone want to? jump in. Um, I know food access and obviously right now food insecurity is a huge issue um, and um, there's, there's not an easy solution to it. Um, anyone want to jump in? Can it? Hey, one piece of, of this is that um, we need to increase the supply and so that's what I see Working Farms Fund helping us with. When we were first starting at Emory to buy local in 2005, 2006, um, because we also needed it to be sustainable food, um, they're just, the, the supply was really pretty limited, especially for a very large institution. And so I really believe by increasing the supply, that's gonna help get more of this high quality food to, into everyone's hands. And then uh, there are a whole lot of partners working on just that issue of food access and food equity, um, who will then have this pipeline of food to tap into. Um, and that's the piece of it that I think this really addresses. But I think Judith, you were gonna say something. Yeah, and, and I, real quick, Judith, I just wanted to add to that that, um, Emory is a great, thinking about how we break down the institutional barriers, right? I mean, schools, that is where so many kids, and especially right now, so many kids get their lunch. I mean, actually, Christian and I were out meeting at a farm, and I was driving on the way there uh, a few weeks ago and was behind a school bus that stopped at a house. And I was confused because I thought school is out, everybody's virtual, and I saw the person go to the door, and I realized they were delivering the meal to that person's door. It was at 11.30 that day and the kid came out and grabbed uh, his lunch. So we have to break down the institutional barriers um, and what Emory has done, you know, starts to show us the way. And there's a lot of funding that goes, funding and, and philanthropic support that goes towards food insecurity. But I agree, we have to scale up supply and then direct that to the right places. And, and, and there's a lot that, of other things that have to be done, but that's a really key piece of this. Sorry, Judith, I think you were going to weigh in there too. Well, no, I, I was just going to say that there's another, another small piece of it um, is leveraging existing federal and state programs um, to connect local food to uh, people who need food. Uh, one of the organizations that I, I helped to start 10, 
or so years ago is Wholesome Wave Georgia. And Wholesome Wave Georgia leverages SNAP, federally uh, subsidized food benefits for um, low income people. And Wholesome Wave Georgia takes the SNAP funds, raises funds privately, matches them for people who shop at farmer's markets. So SNAP recipients now can go to almost a hundred farmer's markets around the state and if the market is participating with Wholesome Wave Georgia, um, they can basically double their double their SNAP dollars or get the food for half price, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of innovations too that can that can step in to help get really valuable, nutritionally dense, fresh, healthy food to all eaters, which yes. is important. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Wholesome Wave does amazing work. I, I know. Um, I think Rodale Institute has done some of that similar type work with hospitals and others in Pennsylvania and is interested in that as well. So, um, yeah, that's great. Christian, any? Um, yeah, I, I think kind of um, on the flip side of that, looking a little bit at the market side of things, there was a question about, you know, uh, are there going to be other institutional buyers that might follow Emory's lead? What other markets might exist for farmers in the Working Farms Fund? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll maybe start there. Um, and I'd be curious to, um, you know, Keith and Kenneth's thoughts on this. But one of the amazing things I'll say about what Emory has done, <laughs> they did all the hard work, I think, before uh, we showed up um, in getting this commitment to local and sustainable sourcing and making sure that their partner, Bon Appetit, was willing to do that. But there's a blueprint there. I mean, and, and Turner, I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, Turner Environmental Law Clinic, which has been so helpful to us throughout the, uh, putting together the Working Farms Fund. We have the guidelines that Emory has shown for local and sustainable sourcing. And I think those are available on their website. Um, and you can see what local and what uh, sustainable means for, for them. They, we have draft uh, an MOU, obviously, that we entered into with Emory um, to show what their commitment is to this. And we have draft food purchase agreements that are ready to go as a template for what Emory and the farmer will be entering into directly. So it's not rocket science. It, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get to get that commitment in place. But Emory, I believe, I mean, Kenneth, you may, I mean, I think wants to lead and see other institutions step into that space. So... Absolutely. Well, as I said, if anyone knows of a potential institutional partner, I'm always happy to talk. And Mindy Goldstein from the Turner Environmental Law Clinic, I'm so glad, Stacy, that you've raised up her work. Um, they are happy to talk and walk through the documents we've prepared. And that's really what we have been hoping for from the beginning is to start a sort of different model, a new way of thinking about this that can be transferred and translated all across the country. Um, so I'm hopeful that people will take us up on that and reach out because um, if it's working for us here, it, it can work anywhere. That's great. Keith, uh, I'm curious. I've noticed too, I mean, I believe that FarmView, you're expanding to other locations in Georgia too. How, how do you think about scaling up the distribution from a, from a more local market that's sourcing for uh, local producers? Yeah, and that's a... It's a really good question. It's one of those things that you and I had talked about earlier. You know, there are parts and pieces of the system that um, I hope Working Farm Fund can work with. Part of it would be distribution uh, because it, for us, as an example, trying to supply product into the Atlanta market, that's been a real challenge. Uh, processing of products is another challenge that's there. Uh, for farmers that sell to us uh, so that they're doing it with safe measures. And so we're making sure we're not, you know, no one's getting sick from, you know, something being handled not properly. So there's, there's those challenges that are out there that have also got to be met to expand this whole uh, the program we're talking about into a, something that's really scalable. And, and, you know, we're, we're dealing with it the best we can. We bought some of our own trucks to start with, our own refrigerated trucks to move product with. Uh, we're using a, a system called Grabber that's in Atlanta. Uh, they're helping with this process also. We are processing some of our own product, like our meat and stuff like that. Uh, from a vegetable perspective, that, that's a challenge for some people to, you know, if you want to go into retail with it, 
you can do farmers markets without having to have all the standards you have to have if you go into retail. Right. Um, so there's there's just several things like that that this group is going to have to also work toward to get that entire logistics piece put into place to really make this something that can be robust for lots of farmers and you know on a bigger scale. Yeah. So. Yeah, this, I'm glad we have a work in progress. I'll say that. And it's no, no, but I'm glad we have people like you thinking about it, Keith. I mean, that that's uh, I think it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, that's great. And can I raise one more thing, Stacey? Because I don't want to make it sound too easy for the institutional <laughs> partner because I that wouldn't be fair. Because right. um, you know, for 15 years we've worked to sort of pave the way for this moment. And a lot of that work is goes to some of the issues Judith raised about the way we eat right now. And so often it's frozen food reheated and served to a critically ill patient, which when you think about it is insanity, right? You know, um, so shifting to whole foods, I mean, that took a lot of work for us to revise our kitchens. I mean, the physical layout of our kitchens, you know, when you start getting a whole carrot that you've got to peel and you've got to slice, you know, that just changes everything. And then you've got to have a big composting system like we have and, you know, just all of that. So um, there's a way to do it, but it does need to address, as Keith mentioned, all the logistics, all the potential barriers that are in place because it is such a paradigm shift from the way we have been eating into this new sort of way of eating. Yep, it's a great, it's a great point. Well, um, Christian, I don't know, we may have time for one more um, question. I think I, I don't want to go over time. Yeah, I will definitely, I'll, I'll lift one up. But I, I also want to note that um, for those of you who have, who have participated, uh, we are really appreciative of all the comments that have been coming in. Uh, there have been a lot of resources flying back and forth between uh, really great folks who are part of their food system and, and part of our local Atlanta food system. So I, I, I want to appreciate them and, and for their participation. And um, there's a lot of great resources in there. So check it out. Um, and on that note, I think, I, I think maybe a great question to kind of end on would be something like, you know, what are some of the results that are happening right now with the Working Farms Fund? What are the partnerships that have emerged? What are the tangible things that are happening today? And, and where are we going from there? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll maybe uh, take that one. Um, the exciting thing that I mentioned is we, we have a pipeline of uh, about 15 to 20 farmers who we're working with to um, potentially match them to farm sites. Um, and, and we are working to identify farm sites, which are coming to us quite often, uh, which is good. And, uh, and we're start, we're getting ready to purchase our first couple of farms. I mentioned love is love. We're very close to the purchase of their first farm. And we're putting all those pieces together at one time. Uh, we've solidified this partnership with Emory, which is great. We are nailing down additional partnerships to support those farmers on site uh, once they get matched to our site, both for sustainable practices, everything they need, equipment, infrastructure, the investments to make them have a successful farm business. So um, we're just getting started. We're launching uh, this year, which is it really exciting, but we wanna build up and scale out from there. So we have amazing partners at the table but um, I view this as a dynamic process and we are going to need everyone. I think one, one common theme you've heard is this is not solved by one, one group alone or one organization. And we have some amazing people at the table, but we're gonna need a lot more to move it forward. So we have, we have a lot of momentum, great partners like the ones you've seen on the panel, but we're in, we're in a really good place. Um, so I, I guess, I, I think that might be our last question of the day. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for the excellent questions and discussion. And I wanna once again, just thank our amazing group of panelists. And I'll say that they are truly the people that give me hope for our future food system. And I wanna thank all of you on the call for your interest and for committing to the time to listen in on this discussion today. Keep an eye out uh, for a follow-up email that'll have additional information. And I would say, please contact 
anyone on this panel or uh, us at the Conservation Fund uh, with questions about the Working Farms Fund, the Conservation Fund, or anything we discussed today. Um, and, and I want to end, I, I know next week is Thanksgiving, and I, I realize this one's going to be quite different for a lot of us. Um, I personally am going to miss my extended family gathering for the first time ever. Um, but I, I will be with my immediate family and we're gonna be able to sit down together and enjoy some incredible food and celebrate the things that we can be hopeful for. And one of the things I'm most hopeful about is the table that the Conservation Fund and these incredible partners are building to transform our local food system. So I, I hope that you will join us. And I just wanna say thanks again for being here. We, we really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Stacy, thank you. Christian, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. See you thank soon. you all so much. And if you have any additional questions or you need to share something immediately with us, please go ahead and, and follow up. Uh, here's our contact information and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, there will be a follow-up email coming and uh, you'll, you'll hear from us soon. But if you need to ask me a question sooner than later, here you go. Have a great, great day. Thanks, Christian.